Uh, so tonight I wanted to get into kind of expanding what we talked on last year. So last year I had the opportunity to talk about and really introduce some of the common uh, native species of bees that are alongside you in your gardens and your landscaping uh, landscaping areas uh, each and every day. And this has become a very uh, passionate topic for me uh, over the last few years. Uh, so I just kind of want to talk about what can we do to kind of conserve those populations. And I really want to focus a good portion of this presentation really to building bee hotels. Uh, some people know them as bee condo, uh, condos. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to go through here tonight. I always like to start with this uh, image here. Um, I know it looks kind of busy, but it kind of brings together all the interesting aspects uh, that are beneficial. There's not just our solitary bees, but to many of our beneficial insects, uh, including that of like uh, butterflies and ladybugs that may be in an area. So we always want to think about what do we need to have at any given location uh, that will help be a benefit to some of those beneficial insects. Of course, we always want to think about one of the most important things, probably that of a water source. Uh, this can be as simple as a bird bath in the area. Maybe there's a water fountain nearby. I know here at the Master Gardener location here in the Minot area, uh, the Mouse River, the Cirrus River is uh, literally right next door and serves as a good water location for many of our beneficial insects. One of the other things to think about in any given area, is there some sort of shelter nearby? Uh, whether you're a, a solitary bee or a ladybug, on those hot days being able to escape the heat, or even on those windy days, uh, this is North Dakota, so it can be pretty windy from time to time uh, in this region, so just having an area to get out of there. Perhaps one of the biggest things though is having multiple or multiple at least two types of flowering plants uh, that's really in bloom throughout much of the growing season so really from the late April early May going all the way through September maybe even early October uh, having a food source nearby is going to be very important to help keeping them uh, excited to be in that area so I really wanted to talk about some of the more basic stuff first and you know I, I talked about the water source already and I said this could be a uh, as simple as a bird bath in the area and I just kind of want to take a quick moment to step back towards that uh, bird baths bird baths work really good uh, in any given landscaping area I just want to put a little bit of asterisks on it um, Places where standing water uh, can be found from time to time uh, can actually draw in a pest insect. Uh, of course, I'm thinking of mosquitoes. Uh, I was reflecting back to 2019, and I know in the Norwich area, uh, West Nile virus was found in that area. So we always have to think about, you know, when we do have a water source nearby, uh, how can we lower the chance of having a site where mosquitoes might flourish? So one of the things we talk about from time to time is if you have a bird bath, take away some of the surface area. Uh, you can do that by adding some rocks to that bird bath that takes some of that depth away, makes that water a little bit more shallow uh, and a little bit less attractive to mosquitoes in that area. One interesting thing I have found in the last month or so, uh, really on my Facebook page to be honest with you is some of those advertisements uh, that kind of pop up on the side I've been seeing one that is a little bit bigger than a hockey puck uh, may, uh, maybe two inches a little bit more across uh, in length or diameter is really been interesting on top it has like a solar panel on top and you set that in the middle of the bird bath and what that is is almost like a small water fountain so it kind of gets that water movement to come up an inch or two into the air and it kind of comes back down uh, using that to put motion in the water can also be a big benefit to reducing um, an area for mosquitoes so because uh, they tend to be drawn to areas with water that's stationary so just having that little bit of motion uh, could be there uh, as we learned a year ago, uh, we kind of discussed some of those uh, solitary bees, and we talked about 70% of them are native 
ground dwellers. Uh, I think oftentimes we think about the honeybees and some of the bumblebees that could be nearby, and we know they're above ground. Uh, they they sometimes are found in uh, bee boxes that have been developed by honeybee. Uh, farmers or growers in the area. Uh, we think of bumblebees that some of those species tend to be above ground, but 70% of our native bee populations are actually ground dwellers. So in any garden location, in any landscaping area, just making sure there's some bare ground that's available for them to make a small den. Uh, remember, most of our solitary native bees uh, really are very non-aggressive. They it's very rare for them to really sting. So having them near a, a place to uh, be able to make a cavity is going to be very important to them. Uh, I am going to say just kind of making sure some of that bare ground is a little bit raised a little bit more. Uh, we do know when we get some of those rainstorms in the area, we don't want those bare spots to necessarily be those draining areas where water is escaping from that landscaping. So that really leaves the other 30%. Uh, that's going to be the cavity dwellers. And really for the bee hotels, that's what this is going to focus on. Uh, they're really cavity dwellers. They're going to look for areas like the bee hotel. Even in trees, for example, you might have a wood picker in years past, maybe had some small uh, cavities in the side of the tree. In the past, you might have had some small wood boring beetles nearby that carved some small holes. Once those are abandoned, some of these small native bees will actually occupy them and take them over and become a, an important source for a shelter for some of these native bees. One of the big questions I'm often asked uh, at some of my uh, demonstrations is, it's the end of the growing season, uh, what should we do with our our garden sites? Is it important to clean them out now? Is it important to uh, maybe leave some of that debris behind for the next year? I guess there's kind of a twofold answer and I'm going to wear both hats here. So I'm going to first start with my agricultural hat. Of course, I'm the crop protection specialist out of Minot. Uh, leaving some of that debris behind can be a place of protection for some of the pest insects. Of course, I'm thinking of something like flea beetles, uh, canola flea beetles that can impact members of the mustard family. Uh, that gives a little bit of insulation to protect them there. Uh, so that part of that makes you think, well, maybe we should clean it out. But if I take that ag hat off and put the horticulture hat on, uh, I always suggest leaving some of that behind. Uh, of course, it leaves a little bit of insulative layer here. Uh, when I look on the right side here, I see uh, you know, it looks like some of the lawn is beginning to green up. I see some of the leaves on the trees, but it looks like this person began to really uh, clean that out at the end of the fall last year. So that takes away a little bit of a layer of protection or insulation from some of those pollinators. Uh, when I come to the left side, I see a little bit more organic debris that has been left behind. I know it's not as eye appealing as getting it cleaned up as you see on that right photo, uh, but a lot of those native pollinators, um, they're not too concerned about how it looks. Uh, they're really just concerned of, uh, is there that barrier there that could help it through a winter? And uh, some of these winters uh, here in North Dakota can be harsh from time to time. So just having that extra layer can be beneficial. So again, it's kind of a juggling act. Uh, for some insect pests, it might be a bad thing to leave that behind. But for our beneficials, it's really a good thing to leave behind. So what is the last thing we could think about for native bee conservation? And that's really going to be providing a bee hotel. And that's what I'm going to focus on for much of tonight's presentation. I really always like to start off with this because one of the big questions I get is, how big does a bee hotel have to be? Does it have to be a decent size? Can it be small? Uh, what does it need to be made out of? And so I like to always start this off with showing you some examples of some of them. Uh, when I start up in the upper right uh, of photo here. Uh, you can see it looks like a, a uh, person kind of just went out and kind of in a you know four or five inch segments kind of cut up a piece of a tree branch uh, that was able to be hung up. Of course if I rotated that around you'd be able to see some of the drilled holes that have been made uh, into the side of that and we'll talk about why those holes are important here in a second. As I move down a little bit uh, you can see we're getting a little bit uh, more closer to the size of a birdhouse or maybe even a bird feeder in size. Uh, of course, you know, 
different size holes is going to attract different types of our solitary bees and they're not necessarily worried about who their neighbor is. It doesn't necessarily to be all mason bees. You might have a carpenter bee in one hole and right next door you might have a blue orchid bee. Uh, they're not too concerned about who their neighbor is. Uh, so having an assortment of sizes there is going to be important and I'll talk about the sizes here in a moment and the types that it really brings in. Uh, when you look in that uh, lower left photo towards the top of that feeder you see it looks like there's straw uh, that's there. Uh, you can almost see a wire mesh that's put across there. So that triangular area is actually not necessarily there for uh, the solitary bees like those lower areas are, that's actually there for some of our other beneficial insects. So for example, maybe a butterfly comes in, they can insert their ovipositor or egg laying device into that and lay eggs into that area. It kind of just gives a little bit more protection for it to those eggs to be there and hatch later. Uh, of course, once they hatch, they'll leave this area uh, more to the um, an area where they can feed more. Uh, to just to show you how big they are, when I move to that upper left corner, you can see this looks like a garden on top of a building here. And you can see a pretty significant bee hotel there that's been left behind uh, that takes up a good portion of that wall. I always like to show this photo up in the upper left here. It's just kind of that surprise, you know, kind of maybe that early morning photo. He's temperature is warming up and he's going to start becoming more active so you can just kind of see kind of bursting out of that bee hotel. Uh, you can see a little bit of a, a cover there on that hotel probably made of mud that is dried out here in time that was placed there for protection uh, in time. Um, when I could jump down to the lower right you see another type of bee hotel, one that's made out of reeds. Uh, that's another option you can have for a bee hotel. So uh, you can have one made out of reeds or bamboo compared to one that we saw on the last slide uh, where it looked like a block of wood with several holes drilled in. Uh, as I was kind of mentioned earlier, uh, I kind of came from that Nebraska area. You know, I was a farm kid growing up in eastern Nebraska. One of the main things that seemed to be everywhere around our yard uh, and many of our uh, neighbors' yards out on the farm was wood pallets. Uh, they just seemed to be everywhere and uh, every spring they just seemed to come in by the dozens and we just never really knew what to do with them. And I found it really interesting that uh, in one of my research, uh, some of the growers, some farmers found it kind of an interesting way to bake a, build a little bit of a bigger bee hotel there. So you can almost see kind of a combination of both some of those blocked uh, bee hotels that are there. Uh, when I look towards the bottom, I see some of those reeds that are implemented there too. So uh, something that I always wondered growing up, what do we do with this once some of our seed pallets arrive? Well, this gives an interesting uh, suggestion of what we can do with some of those wood pallets. So let's get into a little bit more detail here. Uh, there are, are two types of bee hotels uh, that really can be made available for purchase or that can be built. Uh, one, we have the one that's kind of made out of block wood, uh, untreated wood, uh, always trying to say more to the untreated side. We don't know what some of those chemicals, how they could interact with some of the bees coming in and out. Uh, if there are chemicals associated with the wood, it might actually deter them from it really ever being used. Uh, on the right, we have some of the hallowed reed hotel, uh, some of that made out of bamboo. Uh, you can see a lot of the holes there. I can see some of the mud plugs that are kind of shine through the end. So uh, you can just see kind of the two different types here. Uh, in my experience, both of these work fairly well. I've had a little bit more luck with number one here, the untreated wood hotel. Um, I think that's more probably because we have a little bit more control on the size of the holes that we have that we can input there compared to some of the reeds that you can purchase. Uh, kind of what you purchase is kind of what you can uh, offer uh, some of those solitary bee types. Uh, so as I said, uh, you can kind of think about purchasing one or you can think about building one. Uh, bee hotels are pretty common online, uh, everywhere from Amazon uh, to eBay. I found it on Walmart.com and there can be a wide range of price. I've seen them as cheap as about $9.99. I've seen some of them get above $50, some of them even more depending how elaborate and how big of one you're looking for. Uh, the other uh, you can also find them in some stores. Uh, Menards is one in the Minot area. I see th this really pop up usually about early March and they tend to have them in stock really getting to the early part of August. Uh, typically the one I find at Walmart is that one made out of reeds. Uh, it kind of gives a little bit of an interesting design they can put into it but that one's about $10 at Menards uh, 
when it's available. But what if we want to build some of these? And you can have a lot of fun with building it. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about both of them. So one, uh, let's start with a block of untreated wood. Uh, here it says five to eight inches. That's just kind of a base point or a suggestion. Uh, some of those blocks can be different sizes. But it's really going to be the diameter holes that you want to consider and really the depth of the holes that you want to consider. So why is that? So when I was at the University of Nebraska studying my master's and PhD, we had Aaron Bauer, we had Louise Lynch, and Dr. Doug Golick there, and they were kind of focusing in on citizen science projects. And the B Hotel was one of them, and uh, you know, over those years that I was there, I bet you they made several thousand of these B Hotels that they sent out and tested different designs, different holes. And two things really was learned from that. One, the size or the diameter of the hole made a difference in the types of bees that came into it, as well as the depth of the hole. Okay, So when I look here, I've given you the hole di diameter in both inches and in millimeters. Uh, so let's start with like 3 seconds of an inch in diameter. This really brought in some of the types of polyester solitary bees into the area. Uh, as I jump down, I see a quarter of an inch. Uh, in diameter, this brought some different types of leaf cutter bees to the area, as well as some types of mason bees. Uh, as you can see, as you look up and down, the mason bees and some of the other ones aren't necessarily stuck to the quarter of an inch, but they are also not going to attend or occupy all of the different sizes. So uh, I see various mason bees really from 7 30 seconds to 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. Uh, as I jump down to a half an inch, uh, carter bees and blue orchid bees are really going to be some of those bigger solitary bees and they're going to occupy those. The depth was also important. So when you, if you're building one, think about that depth. So if you have a hole a quarter inch or less, you went three to four inches deep. Uh, if you're larger than a quarter of an inch, you went about five to six inches deep. And I'll talk about why that is here in a couple slides. And number two, uh, getting to that hollow reed, you know a lot of times they kind of suggest bundle 15 to 20 reeds or bamboo sticks together, kind of make it a little bit more of a neighborhood if you will. Uh, these are going to be a little bit longer, uh, just be about six to eight inches. Uh, for those reeds for the depthness, okay? And as I said earlier, when you buy some of those reeds, there's a, those holes are kind of established for you. You really don't have the option to change those uh, in terms of the size. So six, eight inches for the hallowed reeds once you tie them together. Uh, just make sure the backside, or at least one end is closed. This will prevent water during a rainstorm or something from moving through it. Uh, and because if you have that happen, they're probably really not going to stick on. <clears throat> So what should I do with the nesting box once this is made? So you're going to take this out and you're going to set it up in your garden area, maybe even uh, a landscaping area. Here it says three to six feet high. Really, you're going to determine this about where do you want to have this situated. Uh, if you're maybe in an orchard area, you have blooming trees and you have this up, it's probably going to be a little bit high. So think about where the blossom uh, canopy is going to be, have it about that height. When you're in a garden or a landscaping area, that height's probably going to be a little bit lower. So think about where those blossoms are. Have it face the east or southeast, especially this time of year is the perfect example to talk about this. Uh, it can get nice and comfortable during the day temperature-wise, but we're still getting pretty cool overnight. So when that sun rises in the morning, if it's facing that southeasterly direction, that sun is kind of rising there and it's going to allow that box to begin heating up right away, giving a little bit more activity to some of those bees. Uh, the last thing to think about is uh, make sure it's uh, situated or attached to something solid. Uh, you want to make sure it can't, that box isn't going to be blown around. If that whole box is moving back and forth, the bees probably won't occupy it. So just make sure it's on a stable surface. So why, we were talking about the depth earlier, and I always like to show these photos on the right side. This is a good example of why. So not only are these holes a protection for them, it allows them to begin laying eggs for the next year. So uh, you can see one of the reeds cut open, one of the blocks cut open. So on the back side, they have like a mud wall there. They lay an egg. They put some food source there so as that egg hatches, it can feed. They build a mud wall on the other side of it to make a cell. Well, they kind of repeat that over and over and over throughout much of that a hole that has been established. And as you can see on that bottom right photo, there's like a quarter, a half inch left on the very end where they plug it. Well, that's really for them to get out of the wind and out of the rain when needed. So they leave a little bit of protection for them, but a lot of this is really to begin the 
the movement to the next generation that will come the next year. Uh, so here, I just want to leave this again with different varieties and types of hotels. Uh, one question I usually get is, what do I do with a B hotel that I've had for multiple years? Uh, do I need to clean it? And the answer is yes. Every two to three years, think about cleaning that. Uh, wait probably for mid-May to come around. That means the eggs that were there from the last year probably hatched and they probably begun to move out. You can put some of this into like a water bleach solution. So usually a teaspoon Clorox to about a gallon water and you can let that soak. If you're noticing a discoloration or molds growing on it, you know, the inside of this is wood. So you can actually toss that into an area that's undisturbed. It will uh, kind of rot as nature would allow it to on its own and you can build your own reeds or new blocks to insert inside of it. Uh, the last question that usually comes up to me is, what do I do in the winter time? Can it stay outside or should I bring it indoors? Uh, you can actually leave it outside. These are native pollinators to the area. They know it gets cold and you're already providing them an extra couple layers of insulation by having them inside these boxes. So they'll be okay to be left outside. Uh, if you bring it indoors, uh, it's usually a lot warmer and you start to get the temperature begin to warm up and you can actually get them to become more active in your garage if you bring them inside. Uh, finally, just in case you are interested in more information, you heard me talk about the research Dr. Do uh, Golak and some of his team did there about bee hotels. This is from the University of Nebraska. It just gives a little bit more information on the results that they found and provides a little bit more background information if you'd ever like to dig deeper. Uh, traditionally, I can Google search this with bee hotel and UNL and it's usually about the first one that comes up. So with that, I would like to uh, thank everyone for their attention tonight, uh, and I'm willing to field any questions. Okay, thanks, TJ. We've got some questions for you. How about, are any of these bees destructive to the house or a wooden fence? So uh, the question being, uh, are the solitary bees destructive? The answer is no. Um, oftentimes, they really just come up to the bee house Really, them bringing in some of that mud or organic debris to make the cell walls is probably going to be as destructive as they ever get. So they're not really playing any damage to uh, the wood or to the house. There are some species like wasp that may have some impact, but when it think, comes to the solitary bees, that's not really a big issue. Okay, you mentioned about uh, mosquitoes in bird baths. Do you have a recommendation about how often you should change the water in your bird bath to prevent the mosquito larva from hatching? Okay, so the recommendation is I would probably do it at least once a week. Uh, that environmental play is going to have a little bit of a determination on there. I mean, if it's a lot hotter, uh, you know, that bird bath might begin to dry out a lot quicker. You may not have a water source, but if it's a little cooler, uh, if it's been a little bit damp, you might actually get that to be a little bit more cloudy in time uh, inside. So at least once a week, but depending on the weather, you might want to do that a little bit more often. Okay. Um, how about in the cleaning of the hotels again? When you clean that hotel, do you clean out the individual holes in the box? So that's actually a really great question. And uh, so I've I have seen some people that do take the time to clean it, but you really don't have to. Uh, as the next generation emerges and they come to occupy it the next year, the bee is going to enter it to see if there's actually anything in there as, as another specimen occupying it. And if they find that it's abandoned, uh, they will actually come through and begin to clean out uh, those holes on their own and they'll begin to set it up to situate it for themselves. Okay, TJ, have you heard about a giant wasp that is new to the United States and affecting our honeybees and crops? And will that affect our wild bees? Have you heard about that giant wasp? Yes. Hmm. So okay. this is, uh, I'm taking a guess you're referring to the giant Asian hornet uh, that has really been a big deal in parts of Southeast Asia, Southern Japan, China. Uh, in 2019, it was actually found in Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada for the first time. In December, it was found in Washington State for the first time. Uh, we do know they can be destructive uh, to bee colonies. 
a honeybee colony specifically, they can bring down large honeybee colonies very quickly. Uh, the, a couple things to think about that are a little bit more calming. One, for them to really make it to North Dakota is probably going to be a very slim chance, maybe closer to none. Uh, they really seem to thrive in tropical, more temperate regions. Uh, we don't really have that tropical fuel uh, here. They also like more of the mountainous uh, forest-like regions. So if on that small chance it would show up here or need help getting here, however, it really wouldn't survive the winter here. Uh, so for those of us here in North Dakota, that should be a little bit more reassurance that it probably wouldn't be that huge of a deal. If it did make it, it would be a very short-term issue. Great, that's good news. I always that's always the nice silver lining about our brutal, bitter cold winters is that it keeps those lot of bad bugs away. Yeah. <laughs> do you agree? <laughs> I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And when it, when it hits twenty five below I always I always feel good. As long as my furnace is working. Right, um, I hear you. <laughs> hey uh T G how about does the color of the B hotels make a difference? Okay, so that's an uh, that's an also an interesting question. So a lot of the B hotels here uh, are, of course, I've shown you wood ones, and there are plastic ones that are available, and some of them come in different colors. Uh, there's actually research out there that shows different types of insects come to different colors, and oftentimes when we think about our our pollinators yellow and some of our whites, our brighter colors tend to be some of their more favorite colors. Uh, they don't see color on the scale that you and I do. Uh, it's more grayed out so those bright colors, those yellow and whites uh, look more like a dull uh, cream color to them. So those tend to be some of the colors that are a little bit more apt to many different types of insects. Uh, with that being said, you can find plastic bee hotels in many different colors. I know uh, I have some in my uh, office that are blue. I have some that are yellow. Uh, I've been kind of playing around with the plastic ones, not really for the color thing, because even some of the blue ones have been occupied. I've been playing more with the plastic ones, trying to figure out uh, what does heat do to it? Because if it gets too hot, plastic is going to retain heat more than the wood. So do they occupy it as well? Uh, last year was the first year I did it, and to be honest, I had no use out of the plastic one last year, but that might just been due to the place I had it set up. So me changing it up this year will hopefully give us more answers to that. Okay, how about, do we have to worry about wasps that move into these hotels? Do they chase the bees away? No, I've never come across that yet where they chase the bees away, and. A lot of times this has to do with when the solitary bees are active. So once it gets into the 60s and 70s, 70s during the day, uh, the bees really are not using the hotel. They're out in the uh, landscaping areas pollinating. And for the most part, so are the wasps. So if they're going to interact with the wasp, it'll be out in those areas. As it starts to cool off at night, the wasps kind of go back to their areas, uh, their shelters. And a lot of the solitary bees do the same. So if there is an interaction, it'll probably, the better chance will be at the uh, landscaping site than it would be at the bee hotel. How about, are you aware of any like municipal zoning issues with uh, these type of bee hotels and attracting them to maybe more like in urban areas? Could that be a problem? That is actually a question I don't know the answer to. I've never come across any issues uh, to this point, at least not with city ordinances. I know from time to time more housing associations. I've heard some being some rules and things set up with those, but when it comes to cities and towns, I've not come across that yet. Okay, how about uh, if, like if a B hotel is inside of a tree, do the activities of squirrels or birds deter the bees? Okay, so uh, when it comes to birds, birds probably might have a little bit more of a deterring impact uh, there than the squirrels. Um, however, once again, the, the comfort there, I guess, will be just when everything is active. Uh, 
you know, during the day, the bees really aren't going to be there to notice that. Uh, from time to time, I know I've seen squirrels coming up to bee hotels, really trying to figure out what is it, what's going on. But for the most part, I've not really seen them uh, mess with it other than that. Yeah. How about, uh, you know, like a lot of these uh, native bees are, uh, they're ground netters, they make the little holes in the ground mm -hmm. and this gardener sees those holes in the ground and they're concerned like there she's careful when she weeds not to disturb them but what about we want to use mulching does mulching affect the, the lifestyles of these bees these ground nesting bees so for the mulching part of this I think mulching uh, using the mulching is fine uh, the one thing is that like if you find the hole is already set up um, maybe just Keep, keep giving it a little bit of a buffer from where the, the mulch is so we're not covering the, that back up. But if you put the mulch down beforehand, it really shouldn't have much of an impact. Uh, it will still find a way to make a cavity there. Okay. Um, there's a question about, uh, have you ever heard of heirloom honey? I never heard that. They're like these old, the native bees make heirloom honey. Uh, so I've never heard of, of that actually yeah. myself, but uh, with the native bees, uh, native solitary bees actually do not make honey. There we go. So. Okay, so much for that. No worries right. there. <laughs> no benefits there. <laughs> right. <laughs> are, uh, are, these, are these native bees aggressive? You know, but there's a lot of people who are allergic to bees and they'd be mm -hmm. very sensitive to putting up a bee hotel. Mm -hmm. So uh, the nice thing about these solitary native bees, uh, these are very calm bees. Uh, it is rare, not saying it can't happen, but it is pretty rare for them to sing. Uh, I always think about the honeybees and some of the wasps. Those are they're a little bit more cautious and alert of their areas, but most of these solitary bees are pretty calm and relaxed, and they tend to mind their own business. So it's been pretty rare that I've come across where the solitary bee is the one inflicting the sting. Okay. How about uh, the overwintering of bumblebees? Mm -hmm. Any comments about that? Okay, so the overwintering of bumblebees, uh, the bumblebees are actually the ground dwellers too. Uh, so they have a shallow underground uh, colony or den. Uh, they don't have colonies quite the size of honeybees. Uh, honeybees can get hundreds in it. Uh, typically a lot of these will be like 30 to 50. Uh, and again, that, that idea we talked about like with the landscaping, with the garden at the start, if you leave some of that organic debris through the winter, that is just another barrier underneath the snow. And keeping in mind the snow acts as a thermal blanket as well. Uh, we usually say for insects, if we get the snow before the bitter cold, it's a lot better uh, than if we get the bitter cold first. So uh, th that's always something to think about. It's putting some of those extra layers there. So if you leave that organic debris there, that'll just be a benefit to help them. Okay, there's a gardener who's tried it. This bee hotel, she's moved it a couple times, but she still can't get any success. No dwellers. Mm -hmm. So, what should she, do you have any advice? Should she keep trying, try another location? Is there a tip about where's the best place to put your bee hotel? Okay, so I would be thinking about what is the kind of the environment that it's in. Um, like I showed some of those bee hotels at the start. Like if I'm on the west side of the building, uh, for example, that's usually a place, you know, thinking in mid-afternoon, it's probably the hottest part of the day. It's going to be a time of the day that gains a lot more heat. It may not be as utilized as a result from that. If it's in an area that, you know, I always think back home, Mom, we didn't, my parents never had the uh, sprinklers that were underground. They just pulled the hose around and moved it around. If they set that up in the wrong spot where it was showering, that bee hotel, that was another thing that kind of kept them away. So kind of think about what your environment may look like uh, that may or may not kind of defer them. But temperature would probably be the big one I'm thinking about. Is it in an area that may be holding temperature there at the hottest part of the day? There's a gardener, uh, we're back to mulching again, and this person was thinking about the use of cedar wood chips because that has a natural insect repellent property. Is that right? Mm -hmm. The cedars do. So would that be suitable for a house found foundation? Um, would that harm the, the underground bees? 
would that make a difference in the underground bees settling in that site if they used a cedar wood mulch? That is a good question. Uh, I've never run into that. I've been into some areas, um, some city ones where you can definitely say it has the scented mulch there. And uh, some of those solitary bees are still pretty uh, well findable there. So uh, in my experience, I've not seen it where it has impacted that, uh, at least to this point. Yeah. So. Now the emerald ash borer, that's not going to go in these hotels, right? No, it, it will not. And luckily so far, uh, knock on wood that we can keep it this way, Emerald Ash Borer has not been found in North Dakota yet. Uh, I know it's, it's been found in parts of Minnesota and uh, just north up in the Winnipeg area. So hopefully they can keep that in those regions and we'll just escape that altogether. But uh, I've not heard of those interacting with the bee hotels. How about there's a lot of questions about bird, uh, uh, bird bass. Now, how do the how do bees and birds interact at a bird bath? Like, uh, are the birds are going to be a threat to the bees? The, the how do the how do those is there should we be protecting our uh, are protecting our bees from harmful birds at the bird bath? Put like put a wire meshing above the bird bath, or do they all just get along in the in the big picture? Or for the most part, they get along with each other pretty well. Uh, the bees are not something that are typically attacked by the bees, so uh, having the netting and stuff around is not going to be a really a big deal uh, for the for the, the two interacting. It's not really going to stop the one from interacting, and uh, the, for the most part, they get along pretty well together, uh, mainly because they are able to fly pretty quickly, and they're a little bit smaller, so they're not as easily findable. Yeah, I don't think that'd be so ugly to have the wire meshing on top of your bird bath. That's right. Uh, that defeats the purpose. But I don't know if you know this, Travis. We're really we're all over the place here. You've got us uh, with so many. We really generate a lot of questions, a lot of interest here. <laughs> so, how about fire glass rocks? Can you put them in a bird bath? Have you ever heard of that? I've never heard of that. Have you ever heard of fire glass? Probably okay, a glassy type of rock. What do you think? <laughs> Yep, so I, I have heard of the fire glass rocks. Those should not lead to an issue uh, from the from the solitary bee perspective. Uh, so really the point of the rock, like I said earlier, is to kind of take away some depth uh, to make a little, that a little bit less suitable to the immature larva of the mosquito. So the type of rock I've never really come across where that seems to have an impact on the solitary bees coming to it. Okay, I think you've got all the questions. Wow, that was a, you generated an amazing amount of interest with your <laughs> bee hotel idea, Travis. So we greatly appreciate your presentation tonight. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.